Welkom terug. Uh, de een na laatste sessie voor, uh, voor vandaag. Uh, ik ben blij dat we Jan Jacob en uh, Leg hier, uh, hier hebben om uh, ons uh, een, uh, mee te nemen in, uh, in een deployment uh, van, uh, van een simulatieomgeving in uh, de Magic Cloud of op someone else's computers. Uh, en dat. Uh, en ik mag dat, uh, dat, dat zo zeggen als echte Groningen, middels uh, DevSecOps. En uh, ik, ben, uh, ik ben benieuwd. Ga je gang. Uh, all right, good afternoon everyone. Uh, good to see so many over here at the NLUG. Uh, my name is Jacob Pebesma and uh, this is uh, my colleague uh, Lech Piek. And uh, together, um, we, uh, together with another intern at the Hansi University of Applied Sciences. Uh, Geert Fischer, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, um, we uh, did a project where we um, where we leveraged an energy system tool suite uh, from a local environment and we migrated it uh, to the cloud using uh, uh, using Kubernetes and uh, DevSecOps. Uh, so, uh, first of all, a short uh, list of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to introduce ourselves. Uh, we're going to give a little bit of context on uh, what you need to know to understand the project. Uh, we're going to talk about the challenges, the implementation, um, what we've learned uh, throughout this project. Uh, then some final words, and then there's some room for some questions and a discussion. So first of all, the introduction. Uh, this is me, uh, Jan Jakob Pebusma. Uh, I'm 22 years old and I'm a student at the Hansi University of Applied Sciences, where I study IT. I'm, in, I'm currently in my last year. Um, uh, I study uh, my major is network and security engineering. Uh, I did a minor in smart energy, where uh, I learned a lot of energy transition, and uh, it actually got me very excited about the energy transition. Um, I, uh, this project I did for an internship at uh, the Desic Ops company, which is part of the Hansel University of Applied Sciences. Um, and uh, after my internship, I got hired there as a student assistant. I don't assist. I don't actually assist the students. I'm a student, and I assist uh, the Hansel University of Applied Sciences. Um, so yeah, uh, here you see uh, a picture which was last year at the NUG. Um it says, fuck off Google. And um, I walked up the stairs and I grabbed my name tag and I went to the table and someone put this picture here, he put it at the table. And at that point I knew I was at the, at the right place. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was at the right place. Uh, because uh, a hobby of mine is uh, escaping the big tech. That's what I like to call them, a privacy uh, enthusiast. So, um, yeah, um, in my free time, I, I'm a Linux user. Uh, I use Fedora. Is there, are there any other Fedora users here? <laughs> um, next to that, I have my home lab, uh, which is mostly running on a Raspberry Pi currently, where I, uh, where I use Docker. And my favorite project, uh, you can see up here, is Home Assistant. Familiar to most of you, I assume. It's a smart home platform. And because of my, um, because of what I learned at the, at my minor uh, smart energy, uh, my dad wanted to have uh, the smart meter you have in the, uh, you have at home. He wanted to have the data of it uh, available in some kind of dashboard. So I did that up there. There you can see uh, our home from a few days ago. It's currently not going very well with the solar panels because it's winter, but. Uh, you can see the gas uh, gas usage. You can see what we what electricity we use, what we produce. My dad wanted to have to, uh, wanted to have that available, so uh, I fixed that for him. Uh, other oh, oh yeah, I use uh, Zigbee because I want to uh, escape the escape the big tech. Uh, a lot of them have their smart home. Uh, uh, they sell their smart home products, but they're not as privacy friendly or secure. So I like to use uh, Zigbee to connect them to Home Assistant, which uh, then they, they're not connected to Wi-Fi and they can't communicate home. Uh, other things, uh, oh yeah, I use uh, Proxmox on my Intel NUC, uh, where I, I host uh, game servers for me and my friends to play games on, which is also something I like to do. 
Yes, and my name is Lech Bielek. Uh, I'm your co-presenter today. I'm uh, a little bit older, 43 years old. Uh, I'm a lecturer or eternal student, whichever you want to call me. I did a master's uh, in Groningen uh, in energy and environmental sciences at the university, and I'm uh, alumnus of the software engineering um, major of Hans University of Applied Sciences. So I'm working at my old um, school. Uh, in the meantime, I have worked for TNO, which is a research institution, which we'll tell a little about, a bit more about later on. But uh, I work as a researcher at uh, Professorship New Business in IT, and I teach classes in the software engineering uh, department, uh, operating systems. I remember as a student that I installed um, Solaris for uh, x86, uh, while everyone else was installing Windows Server and, and Linux, and I always like tinkering with software and operating systems. So I have to admit, my work laptop runs Windows, but I have a lot of different hardware at home that all runs different versions and uh, distributions and tastes, so both Mac, Linux, and, uh, and Windows. Um, other hobby I picked up uh, is, is sim racing, which has a dedicated PC. Uh, I am uh, grateful to have four children in the ages between 17 and 11, two boys, two girls, and they all have desktop PCs. So I keep building PCs and, sh and sharing them down the line, and, uh, which, make us, uh, yeah, which makes for a nice hobby. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that I used to coordinate the Minor Smart Energy. This is where Jan Jacob and I met, and um, that this is kind of the main team, Smart Energy, of our uh, presentation. So to the context, um, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, there is a big transformation, the digital transformation. Um, compared to a decade ago, there is so much more data available. There's so much more compute and everything is interconnected. Things are changing. We used to do things in a different way. You, 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 you wouldn't have online banking. You do, wouldn't have online shopping and so on. But this trend is continuing and basically everything is transforming. However, some things around us are still pretty old fashioned like um, our energy infrastructure, which has been around for, for 50 years or longer. And the way we use it is changing. In the past, we have used um, fossil fuels for, mo uh, for mobility and for heating our homes. Uh, coal-fired power plants, and they have one thing in common, that um, we use the energy that is available to us, and for example, with electricity, the supply um, is dictated by demand. But if we switch to renewable sources, which we are doing in the energy transition to, to cut carbon dioxide emissions, um, we need to change this paradigm, which is a big shift. We need to adapt our demand for energy to the supply of renewable energy. And this is nice because this is where IT comes into play. So to do this, um, TNO, my former employer, uh, has done research into ESDL, which is uh, the Energy Systems Description Language, which is a standardized XML-based system for exchange of data between different energy modeling tools and energy models, simulation tools. So. There are different layers, the transport layer, for example, the electricity network or the gas network. Uh, there's storage, like batteries or uh, hydrogen storage. There are conversion uh, units, like generating hydrogen uh, through electrolyzers, for example, or fuel cells. Uh, there's, of course, consumption in the residential area, so he heat consumption, uh, demand, electricity demand. Um, and gas demand, uh, and there's production, and there's an increasing amount of decentralized production. And for example, the electricity network needs to be in constant balance. So production, demand, and supply need to meet on a second-to-second -second basis. So changing the way our world is working and, and how all these things interact becomes very complicated. And ESDL can help researchers make their systems and their models interoperable so we can figure out how to tackle this transition and use IT to, um, to make this happen. 
So I already mentioned TNO. TNO is a Dutch research institute um, for applied scientific research. The mission is to uh, generate innov innovative solutions with demonstrable impact to achieve a safe, healthy, sustainable, and digital society boost the earning power of the Netherlands. There's a special law that uh, requires this institute to exist. And to the right, you can see they've made this GIS, Geographical Information System, where you can put these assets on a map together with other stakeholders and create models that model the energy flow. This tool is developed and maintained uh, by people at TNO. SIM is the simulation tool, and ESDL is the descriptive language in which you can save and exchange these, um, these models. So where do we come in? At the entrance. Uh, entrance is, uh, <laughs> ooh, no pun intended. Entrance is one of our centers of expertise at the Hans University of Applied Science. It's in Dutch called Innovatiewerkplaats, um, basically field lab. Uh, here, research, education, and uh, professional practice come together. Um, I've worked at Entrance since uh, the inception, since 2012. Uh, one of the professorships at Entrance uh, is uh, the professorship system integration, and they deal with these kinds of complicated problems where all the demand and supply, conversion and so on of different systems come together. Um, there's a, a, a number of researchers, uh, about 10, and they use the, these tools, ESIM and ESDL, in research. And there's different uh, places in our curriculum, in masters and in bachelors, where um, these tools are used. So, Maybe it's still a bit vague, so we can move to a short demonstration so you have a little bit more context. Don't mind my edge browser. Oh, it's already here. <laughs> yes, well, you can start from the top if you want. Uh, yeah, I'll... Uh, uh, so this is the map editor, as you can see. This is where you would define um, uh, the energy system where you would um, create uh, different kind of uh, components from the ESDL that uh, Lech just uh, demonstrated. Uh, I, um, this is called the ESDL drive. It's basically a repository where you can put your, uh, save your ESDL files and load them back up again so you can share it easily with colleagues uh, across different projects. As you can see, there's a project folder. In this case, I've made a demo file already so we don't have to create a system from scratch. Uh, this is the demo file. You can see it on the big screen. I was afraid that you couldn't for a second. Um, so this is where we are right now, the Van der Valk Hotel in Utrecht. Um, we'll start with the green thing here. Um, this is import. This is where the energy gets imported. Uh, actually, I'll start from the other side. I'll start over here, which is heating the mount. We're here in the winter. It's very cold, and of course, uh, the, the building needs to be heated. Uh, and here we can uh, define uh, heating demand. Uh, we can assign a profile to this. And this is a, a basic uh, profile, which is loaded from InfluxDB. It's basically a normal profile of a household. In this case, it's not really important. We're not going in very in-depth. This is the, the first tutorial, which you can also find in the repository uh, of TNO. On GitHub. On GitHub. Yeah. It's called a uh, Docker tool suite. That's the name of the repository. Um, in order for us to have heat, we need a gas heater, of course, which heats the gas. In this case, uh, you can define some units here. In this case, it's got six kilowatts of power and it has an efficiency of 0 0.9. And then uh, the gas needs to be imported, of course. You need, uh, you need gas from somewhere in order to turn it into heat, and that's what the green thing is. Um, where we are importing uh, one million watts of gas. Then, when you're done uh, building, uh, building your map, uh, map with all the energy units, you can simulate them with ESIM, which you do by pressing this, and then we can give it a name here, uh, NLUG, and we'll run it, and hopefully it doesn't crash. Uh, it's done, nice. So this is Grafana. This is where all the results get uh, visually represented. So what we just did is um, 
ASIM uh, just simulated the, the, energy, um, the energy system we created and it then visually represents it in Grafana. So the results get loaded into Grafana right here and you can see some graphs of how it works and the researchers can use this. So this is uh, basically how, how the tool works. So we can now go back to the PowerPoint. Are there any questions about this? Yes, one thing I'm missing here is, uh, and, and, and I think it's in the, in the SDL, is uh, uh, building insulation, for example. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a well-insulated building, then you don't lose a lot of heat, and your graph ch changes yeah. accordingly. Yeah, this is a very simple example yes. for demonstration purposes, but as we will get to, the models can become really complex and uh, influence the stability of our system. Spoiler <laughs> well. alert, yeah. Oh, the backup. Oh, challenges, yeah. yeah. So, uh, as you can see, this is uh, uh, the architecture of the tool suite that we just saw. It all starts over here, the part you didn't actually see, it's the pink part. It has key cloak in it, which is for authentication of and authorization. So this is where, uh, where administrators can create accounts for their users um, to use and make sure nobody can access uh, the wrong files. For example, if you have a project, uh, you wouldn't want that project to be accessed by random people. That's what key cloak in this uh, occasion is for. And it's the first thing you see when you load up the tool suite. Then the key cloak redirects you to the ESDL map editor, which you can see here. In the ESDL map editor, you, can, you have the map interface where you can define the energy system. Um, then the orange part over here is the ESDL drive where you can save the files, uh, save your files, uh, load your files back up again if you want to use them again. Um, then the blue part is uh, ASIM. SM simulates uh, simulates the energy uh, the energy system you just created, and then it, you can see it sends the results to Grafana. Uh, these are the different databases that we use in the background. Um, you really read you really need these three kinds of databases because they all do different things, and that shows uh, the complexity of this uh, tool suite. So, uh, how was this originally used at the Hanze? Uh, well, the researchers were using this uh, locally, or, or had to run this, uh, this tool suite locally on their laptops, which is not very handy because the laptops were managed employee laptops. And so, they couldn't install tools like Docker Desktop to get this to work. So they had to go to their boss and ask, can I install this? And it was just a, a, a very big hassle. Um, there's uh, three different Docker Compose files that the tool suite consists of, which you would need to set up in a very specific order. And you would have, you need to do some very specific tasks in order to get it to run. And it's very fault tolerant. Uh, if you make one mistake, uh, you have to start over again. Uh, if you stop using the tool suite, you shut down your laptop and you start it back up again. The tool suite doesn't start in the right order, which just causes massive headaches for the researchers because they just do, want to do their job. They want to research and not uh, maintain this environment. Uh, another big um, problem of this is the resource usage and uh, battery drain. Uh, because the tool suite is such, uh, so research intensive, uh, resource intensive. Uh, the battery drains quite fast um, and therefore it's not very practical and um, it uses a lot of res uh, resources which the uh, laptops at the hands uh, they might not uh, have, it, have that much available to the, res uh, to the researchers. So uh, Lech is going to explain how we are going to solve this problem. Yes, um, tools like these are not supported by our um, our uh, IT department. So they do education, they do the managed laptops, but uh, research applications kind of fall in a gray area. And I've been involved, I've been working at Hansa for 14 years in, in managing a lot of these applications and keeping them afloat mm -hmm. in my spare time. Um, and these things really get out of hand. And one thing we've noticed is that a lot of our students work on assignments during their studies in greenfield situations where they start from scratch. 
which is not very representative of the real world. So we thought, how about we create a learning environment where our students from all three majors, Bedrijfskundige um, Informatica, uh, what is that? Business, IT and Management, Software Engineering and Network and Security Engineering work together in a modern way, in a DevSecOps way, uh, and work on these digital transformation projects on topics of smart mobility, energy, healthy aging, and agriculture. So, in this continuous way of working, uh, where development and operations come together, and security is part of every step along the way, um, we thought this is a great opportunity to, to work with our DP IT department. They are on, are, they are on board on, with, with us, they are helping us, which is really nice to, to create this working environment. Last semester, when uh, we did our first batch of students, uh, we had about 20 students, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we want to extend this into the future, working like this. So at Hanse, the answer to everything is Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, in this slide, the plan, is, uh, the plan phase can be, uh, be, be done with Azure boards. Uh, we, uh, there's Git integration, there's Azure repos, which is uh, Git private repositories as part of your DevOps, Azure DevOps services, pipelines to automate things, builds, artifacts, the whole integrate build package thing is done by TNO. We are actually do more of the SecOps side of things. Testing releases. Eventually, we released that to uh, Kubernetes, Azure Kubernetes services managed. And uh, the monitoring, everything is done in Azure. Um, while it's not perfect, it's good. It's integrated with our Azure Active Directory. So all students and employees have accounts. We, it has a fi very fine-grained way of uh, giving access rights and, and opening firewalls and so on. So there are benefits uh, as well. So we came up with a kind of onboarding process to do this because a lot of these research applications are on physical hardware or, or run in some container or on a virtual machine. So basically the first step is the onboarding step where we take on board the application and look at what it's really like and whether it's secure and so on. And then we try moving it to our DevOps environment where we look if we can break it up into microservices, store the secrets in a safe way, if we can use shared databases to, to reduce cost and so on. And in the final stage, uh, we want to uh, run production, uh, use containers if we can, monitoring uh, the health of the services and keep an eye on the costs, make sure that everything is accessible through secure APIs and so on. Um, so this is our, uh, our onboarding process. So what have we learned? Yeah, so now let's go to the fun part, which is uh, the lessons learned, which, spoiler alert, are <laughs> quite a lot. Um, so the first phase, um, we installed the Docker toolset. We installed it on an Azure VM, and we attached the domain name to it, so it was publicly available to the researchers. Um, we made some improvements to the Docker tool suite, like uh, making, um, turning the free uh, Docker Compose files, we turned it into one. Uh, we've automated the deployment using a setup script. Um, all the environment variables which the users had to set, uh, we made one environment file where you could put these one time and don't have to um, set them up all over the place. So we made some improvements to it to improve the ease of use. Um, yeah, then the, we, set the, we set the VM up and um, the Docker tools it was running, it was publicly available, it was working very well. We said to the researchers, uh, be careful, um, this is a test environment, we haven't tested it for early yet and it might do unexpected things. Uh, but yeah, the researchers, they went ahead, they started using our implementation and they at first were quite happy with it. Um, Another thing, uh, at the Hanse, we have a policy that says no VMs 
Um, this is because at the Hans we don't have the administrators to administrate all of the different PMs. Um, you can imagine uh, the Hans University, uh, they have a lot of different projects running. Uh, it can, the amount of VMs, they, it can go up very, very quickly. And they don't have the administrators to uh, manage all, these, all of these VMs. So we have to implement a solution without, uh, without VMs. Now, um, we went to stress test with the researchers, and um, one of the researchers said, hey, I have this big file, we can use this uh, to, to, to stress test your, uh, your environment. And my colleague, Geert, he said, yeah, 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 do it, do it. I said, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it. It might blow up, and well, it blew up. Um, the VM, all of a sudden, it became uh, unresponsive. Um, it went down in Azure Portal. We couldn't do, um, we couldn't interact with it at all. Uh, when we tried to select the logs to see what was going on, it kept loading and loading and loading. And in the end, we got no metrics out of it. So, um, yeah, it might have been a good idea to go for a for a little bit of um, to start with uh, to start a little bit easier, because now we planned this entire session with the researchers to stress test, and it was done after two minutes. <laughs> So yeah, that was a, a first big lesson learned. Um, it didn't get any better. <laughs> um, in phase two, we decided to try um, an Azure Container uh, Instances, uh, which is a, server, uh, a serverless solution where you don't have a VM. Uh, and uh, the logging implementation of uh, Azure Container Instances um, it was pretty lackluster. We tried um, to deploy uh, one MongoDB container, a simple container, and um, it kept crashing every time we, we, tried to, um, we tried to start it. So we thought, check the logs, you know? Um, the logs, they contain critical information. They will solve your problem. But every time we tried to check the logs, um, well, if the container crashed, the logs went away. And we were like, why is it doing this? Uh, it turns out it was, uh, well, after a long time of troubleshooting, we found out it was per, uh, volume, permission, uh, volume permissions. Uh, so we spent two weeks trying to troubleshoot it, and we, we couldn't find a solution. So then we went to Leg and uh, we had it. Well, uh, it was a, the other way around. I noticed that Geert and Jan uh, Jacob were, were less and less <laughs> motivated. I was wondering, yeah. these guys were doing such a great job. Yeah. Were very motivated. What was going on? And I really need to, to administer some pep talk, because our great idea of uh, the intermediate step to use Azure Container uh, repository and uh, instances made them uh, really depressed, actually. So uh, yeah. we decided to move on to a Kubernetes cluster and uh, see how that would go. Yeah, but it was like a two-hour therapy session. It was not, it was not very nice. No, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, it happens when you go to the cloud. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Especially using Microsoft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is the third phase uh, where we have uh, uh, where we have deployed it to Azure Kubernetes services, which you might think uh, Kubernetes, it's so much more complex than Docker, right? Um, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy already spoiled the answer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so uh, we used a, a tool called Compose.io, which translates a Docker Compose file. It translated it to a Kubernetes file, which you can then test in something like Minikube to see if it works. So we did this with the Docker Compose file. It's not one to one, by the way. Uh, we did this with the Docker Compose file, and it just worked. It was pretty easy. Uh, so along with watching some tutorials on the internet, and um, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, by the way, uh, me and Geert, we had no prior knowledge of Kubernetes at all. We were jumping into, uh, into the depths. So uh, yeah, we we really had no idea about anything regarding Kubernetes, and we had to uh, read a lot into the documentation and into the videos. Um, what we ended up adding to this uh, is a traffic <coughs> proxy, and you can kind of see how uh, we set up our domains in this case, and how they uh, go to the individual um, assets of the Docker tool suite. Uh, we've, used, uh, we've used Helm to deploy uh, the traffic uh, ingress controller. More about it later. 
so first of all, Composer.io, uh, well, as I previously said, it translates the Docker Compose files into Kubernetes manifest, which you can use. But it's uh, an important thing to note is that it's not one-to-one. -one. Some of the functionality of Docker is not available within Kubernetes, or things just work kind of a different way. Uh, so Composer.io chooses to not implement these at all, which is fine. Um, it doesn't break any functionality, and you can add it back later yourself when you've gained more knowledge about Kubernetes, or maybe you already have that knowledge that you can add it back yourself. Um, yeah, you can. It's ready to run in something like Minikube or K3s, for example. Uh, the only thing we had to do is uh, we had to change it up a bit because we're running it in a cloud uh, provider, of course. We're running it into Azure, and Azure does things a bit differently. Um, an example uh, would be uh, the volume, uh, the, volume, the kinds of volumes you can use in um, your persistent volume claims. Uh, you need to add it from the default option to something that says uh, Azure. Uh, here you can see a picture of how you do it. It's very easy. Um, then we also use Helm. Um, Helm is basically a package manager for Kubernetes that makes it really easy to deploy uh, anything actually to Kubernetes. Um, it's uh, community driven, uh, so the community can create their own configurations which you then can use in your cluster, which it saves a lot of time and it's, it makes it really easy. Um, uh, it's a pre-made config by someone from the community, so you really need to pay attention uh, who made this, did the official maintainers of the, of the, um, of the container uh, create this, uh, did someone else create this, uh, did they set it up correctly. Um, you need to not just uh, deploy something random off the internet, of course, that you find. Uh, we ended up using this in a lot of different ways, as you can see here. So um, these two things, uh, KubeCost and Trivi, we will get back to later. Uh, we use this, um, we use this, uh, uh, we use Helm to set this up in our cluster. Um, yeah, and that's basically how it works. So someone on the internet, a maintainer of a, of a container, he makes a template, and you then download the template and deploy it to your cluster. Uh, you can make uh, manual uh, changes yourself uh, in a, in a file which you can then give to the Helm command. So you can still edit it a bit to your liking. So then, <laughs> during the summer holiday, um, well, the researchers, of course, I was on the summer holiday, I was having a good time. Uh, but the researchers, uh, they carried on working, of course. Um, and uh, the entire environment, it, it, it crashed, uh, just like uh, the one time um, where we were stress testing it. Uh, in this case, we were able to find uh, the culprit, which was SIM. Um, SIM was taking a lot of RAM, and so much RAM, um, that the entire node just ran out of memory, and it crashed, and it couldn't, uh, couldn't recover. Um, so yeah, this is an oddly familiar situation. Uh, it looks a bit like uh, the situation we had in the beginning, and it might actually be the same cause, because uh, you remember the one researcher used a really big uh, ECL file and then simulated it, and then uh, the entire environment crashed as well. Uh, an important thing to note, uh, to learn from this, is you can set resource limits within Kubernetes, which you can prevent um, uh, ab uh, applications from using too much memory or too much GPU. Uh, so this doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, then we'll talk a bit about uh, the costs. Um, at the Hanse, we want to be able to see uh, the cost of the individual projects we have. Um, so we would have one project in one namespace, then the other project in another namespace. Uh, we tried to see this with, uh, with the Azure cost, but Azure cost only so shows us um, the thing that's above. It shows us this nice graph, which is the total amount of cost we use in our, Kuben uh, our, our Kubernetes cluster cost, and we want to see it per project. So uh, Lech did some research, and he, he came to me and he said, I found this. Uh, I found this uh, container called uh, KubeCost. Can you deploy it on a cluster? And I, of course, said, yes, I have Helm. This is super easy. I'm going to fix it for you, which I did. And it ended up being pretty helpful. Um, KubeCost, it recommends you um, um, cost optimizations. 
So it says you can change the resources limits in this way and that will be more efficient for your project. Um, and it lets you uh, see the cost by namespace, which we will see in the next slide. An open source alternative to this is open cost. Uh, open co uh, QCost is actually based on open, open cost, and we, re we only recently found this out, so we didn't get the chance to try it yet. Uh, we'll explore it in the future, however. So here you can see the, um, that you can see on the on the left there is the, the namespaces, and you can see um, the costs they have in the total cost over here. So yeah, this is just an example we borrowed yeah. from the internet um, because <laughs> oh yeah, uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, one of the other things we've uh, ran on our Kubernetes cluster is Trivi. Um, I didn't know about Trivi. I didn't have any experience with Kubernetes myself. I'm a software engineering lecturer, and maybe I should have, but what we did for our fourth year software engineering students is an elective course, uh, application security. And uh, we were designing this course with my, uh, my co-worker, Arjan, and it was a very interesting journey for us. We've learned about SAST, about DAST, about uh, dependency scanning and so on. And we ran across this tool, Trivi, which can be used to do file system scanning, software bill of materials, uh, and container scanning. So I contacted uh, Jan Jacob and said, hey, we've ran cube cost, and that went pretty smoothly with those Helm charts. So how about we run Trivi? So, uh, Jan Jacob came back to me in maybe two hours or so, he said, oh, it's got it running, but look at the results. And we found some 9.8 critical severity uh, vulnerabilities and a lot of false positives and, and a lot of stuff, but it was kind of eat your own dog food principle, uh, practice what you preach. So we just apply what we learn and it was interesting part of our journey and now it's implemented so it can run periodically and yeah, one thing to add is uh, one container, for example, it had over a thousand vulnerabilities, which is kind of, um, well, okay. it, it shows you what you're actually running on your cluster. It makes you, it makes you pretty uh, aware. Check. So then comes another holiday, the autumn holiday, and uh, we found out that researchers can break things, but students assist, student assistants can break things as well. Um, so... Uh, Jan Jaak was trying to fix this resource limits problem, and we had KubeCost running, and we had Trivi running, and we had SIM, ASDL, ToolSuite running, and people were using it. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, after the holiday, I hear from Jan Jaak, yeah, things are really slow, and yeah, we don't know why. So he tried reverting some of these resource limits, and everything stayed very slow. And then people started complaining, the researchers, and thank God we weren't using this in our any lectures with students, because that would be would have been disastrous. And um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to blame Jan Jacob here, really, but we don't know the cause. So we don't know what happened, but everything got super slow. And I, well, uh, mea culpa, I was letting Jan Jacob work in our environment. There was no separation between development, testing, or production. There was just one cluster because, you know, we're a small professorship, we're trying to keep costs down. Yeah, so we've learned uh, a huge lesson here to, to, to spend uh, the money and have separate environments and, and make sure we don't break things. Uh, but uh, yeah, so containers don't solve all problems. Uh, yeah, it's, it's still the humans that are, uh, are the most difficult. So some final words to wrap things up. Um, our results, well, we went from running Docker desktop locally and having all kinds of issues to, to running it in the cloud, in our own cloud in Kubernetes. Uh, in, we don't have to deal with all nasty Microsoft things. We get the benefits uh, mostly. It's fully functional. It's being used by researchers and students. Uh, it's, uh, there's continuous improvements. Uh, our changes have been adopted by the developers at TNO. Uh, there have been pull requests. Uh, we've had some, uh, some meetings, and uh, TNO was actually very enthusiastic. Uh, that was the whole thing of open sourcing the tool suite. So uh, we're looking forward to work together in future. Um, 
we got on to the cost management, which solved our issues. We've, we're planning to use Kubernetes for more projects in the future. So having fine-grained uh, insights into the cost will help us share those costs with the projects and make sure that we keep ourselves afloat uh, with this uh, DevSecOps IT company, uh, as we call the student uh, learning and working environment. We've implemented first steps in, with the security scanning and found out there is uh, plenty to do. DevSecOps was new to us. We realized that uh, it actually requires quite a high maturity level of your organization, and we are not there yet, so we're learning as we're going. It's not just about the tools. Tools is one thing, but there's also a lot of um, people involved and a lot of culture, and uh, culture is something that uh, is slow to change. Um, we have small teams that's really holding us back. Uh, we have uh, student assistants like Jan Jacob. Uh, he is only working eight hours a week for us, and the rest of the time you need to spend studying because you've, you've been kept really busy by a coworker, Jos Bos. Uh, but there's an overlap between what you do for us, for the DSO IT company, and for your studies, which is really nice. Uh, we did more SecOps than Dev, so we want to invi um, involve the, uh, the software engineering uh, faculty more. Uh, actually, have true CI/CD pipelines. So Azure is fast, uh, convenient, but also costly. We've noticed that uh, if you have things scale up automatically and you run out of resources, then the costs go up really fast, <laughs> which is uh, very convenient for Microsoft, but not for us. And we use Azure DevOps services. Sorry? We, we use Azure DevOps services, which is really nice, but also it can be a bit rigid and convoluted at times. So almost there. Yeah, so the lessons learned uh, from Kubernetes. Uh, well, we learned that Helm actually makes things uh, very easy uh, to deploy and get started on with, at, uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, tools like KubeCost, it can uh, improve your costs and help improve insight in your costs, how you can improve, uh, uh, make your cluster more cost efficient. Uh, you need to monitor your setup closely, of course, um, to properly uh, set up the limits and requests. It's a really good way to set up the limits and requests. If you monitor closely, you can see what does my application actually use, um, uh, what does my application use 97% uh, of the time, what does it use uh, the maximum, and then you can set limits appropriately. Um, well, a dev and a prod environment are essential to, uh, to make um, to actually develop, uh, if you don't have these and you start messing with the production environment, um, everything uh, blows up. Um, and um, Trivi makes it easy to, uh, uh, Trivi may, uh, provides easy insight into security. Uh, you can yes, so that's it, that's all. Uh, any questions? Or remarks? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just one question. How are, how are you going to uh, develop this uh, ecosystem environment in the future? So, do we have something uh, implemented implement to, uh, uh, to, uh, to drive your less learn, less learn forward to the next student assistant and development teams? Yes. Um, we are a complex tag. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. One of the things uh, we have implemented is using the Azure DevOps services, which, com which comes with a number of mm -hmm. features such as source code control and a wiki. And we encourage the students and our student systems to use that wiki to document things in a central location so future student groups can keep on working this way. And we try to involve lecturers, have them run the projects. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. it's not really a lift and shift towards another platform, although it's Kubernetes-based. 
are you planning to make it less tight to Azure from the deployment perspective? Yeah, so um, we've deployed a part of our um, Part of our setup, um, we've contributed back to TNO to their repository. We made pull requests. Uh, so, uh, in order to do this, we uh, we made it um, usable with tools like Minikube. So everything Azure, Azure related, we removed from it and we replaced it with something that can be used in Minikube, for example. So everyone can use it. Last question. Is the language is that one? Dutch only, or is it a European uh, project, or is there a more initiative which, which have competition? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if there is much competition. It's open standard, so it's XML, it's human readable, there is schema defin definitions. Um, there is a link included in the presentation, and I believe it's coined by, by TNO, but it's open, and it is used in practice between a lot of models. Okay, thanks again.